All right, look down at verse number 12. Psalm 19 and verse number 12. The Bible says this, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Verse number 13 has a phrase that I'd like to speak about. It says, innocent from the great transgression. That's what I'm going to speak to you about tonight. Innocent from the great transgression. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. Lord, I yield myself to you. Holy Spirit of God, please fill me. I ask you, Lord, for the mind of Christ. Help me to say only that which you once said. If there's anybody among us or listening online that needs to be saved, Lord, please help them to get saved tonight. And then, Lord, uh, please be with our, um, our country. Dear God, with this, this mess that's with this election, Lord, I, I don't understand any Christian at all that's in favor of socialism and communism. I just, I just don't understand it. And Lord, this has been an incredible, incredibly difficult year, not just with coronavirus, but now the fraud that's in the election and Lord, all of it. I just pray for truth and justice to prevail. I just want what's fair and what's right and what's just. So Lord, please give that to us. But most of all, <coughs> help America to have a spiritual awakening. Help us to come back to you, dear Lord, please. And we'll give you all the glory for what you'll do. Please bless us tonight. Speak to our hearts. And we'll thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Innocent from the great transgression. Um, in this passage of Scripture, there's some things that obviously every single word of God is, is important. And so we're going to focus on some specific words tonight. But God says, um, and by the way, uh, David wrote this psalm. And, um, and he, he talked about errors. He talked about secret, secret faults, and uh, all of us have those. And, um, but then he talked about, I want to be innocent from the great transgression. And uh, the word innocent means this. If you're taking notes, please uh, write these notes down. If you're not taking notes, then just uh, look at me while I'm talking. But anyway, uh, but innocent, it means this. Free from guilt, not having violated the law. All right, so that's what the word innocent means, free from guilt, not having violated the law. Now, the phrase great transgression, it means primarily two things. It means, first of all, exceeding violation of the law with the most severe of consequences. That's the first definition. Um, exceeding violation of the law with the most severe consequences. That's the great transgression. The second definition is this, to cross a line with God and forfeit all or part of the will of God. The great transgression is when you cross a line with God, therefore you are forfeiting either all or part of the will of God. I'm going to give you five examples tonight of five people that either were great in the faith or had the opportunity to be. And, um, and, they, and they had the great transgression. So I'm going to give you some, some examples of that um, tonight. There is a point of no return. The Bible talks about that in the book of Proverbs. It talks about no remedy. Um, um, a, 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 an opportunity that you can commit a sin or do something that there's no getting back from. Like for example, um, adultery. Um, someone that's married who commits adultery, uh, the Bible literally talks about their reproach will never be taken away. I mean, it's gonna be with them some way, shape or another the rest of their lives. Now I know that people can recover from it. They can get right with God. You know, they can still you know, serve the Lord. But that reproach, uh, at least in some part, it'll always be there. There are certain sins and certain things that we can do that God calls the great transgression. And David said, I want to be innocent from it. Now, let's look at five people in the scriptures that committed a great 
transgression. This is all going to be introduction. So, uh, first of all, look at Numbers chapter 20. Turn over to Numbers <coughs> chapter number 20. Numbers chapter 20. And we're going to read two verses. Verses 11 and 12. Numbers chapter 20. And by the way, the great transgression is not just one sin. It could be any number of sins, any number of them. But for you, it's, it's causing you to commit the great transgression or to have that seriousness of consequences. Look at verse 11, Numbers chapter 20. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and the, their beasts also. And the Lord, now watch this, spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. We see here one of, if not the, greatest leader that's mentioned in the Bible, Moses. He was raised in Egypt <coughs> for 40 years. He left Egypt and spent 40 years on the backside of the desert training and preparing for what he did not know, but God was going to send him back to Egypt and then for 40 years bring the children of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. Moses was one of, like I said, if not the greatest leader, humanly speaking, that is recorded in the scripture. And yet God said to him, Moses, you crossed the line. I told you to speak to the rock. And instead you smote it. You're not going to be allowed to go into the promised land. Moses died before the children of Israel went into the promised land. Why? Because he smote the rock a second time instead of speaking to it like God said. Now, some of us may say, man, that doesn't seem like such an egregious act. Well, if you just look at the act, okay, when, when God told Moses to get water from the rock the first time, he said, take your rod and smite it. And then the water came out to give, uh, quench the thirst of all the Hebrews and all the, the cattle. Well, for whatever reason, as they're journeying through the wilderness, the, uh, the rock dried up and the people started getting thirsty again. And so Moses went to God and said, God, what do I do? And here's what he said, speak to the rock and water will come out. Well, Moses got angry at the people because of their criticisms and their griping and their murmuring and their complaining. So he let his temper get the better of him and he, instead of speaking to the rock, he smote it. Now, the water still came out. But the Bible tells us that God said, because you believed me not to sanctify me in front of all these people, I think is the actual words that, um, that, that, he, that he mentioned there. But he said, because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of all the, of the children of Israel, he says, you're not going to go in the promised land. Now, what's the big deal about smiting the rock twice? Well, we read in, in, in the New Testament, the Bible says that rock was a spiritual rock. And that rock was Christ. Jesus only had to die once to pay for our sins. That, now, now watch this now. When you get saved, all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Amen? As far as your record book in heaven. There is a book in heaven that has your life on it. Everything that you've ever done. And I mean that with all of my heart. Everything that you've ever done is written in that book. But the moment you get saved, God takes everything that is a sin and he wipes it clean, washes it white as snow on that record book in heaven. But now when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, our sins can still get in between us and God. And that's why 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our, 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 if we confess our sins, we being Christians, those of us who are already saved, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Wait, I thought I got forgiveness when I got saved. Why do I have to, after I got saved, confess my sins to the Lord and get forgiveness again? Why? Well, because there's two different applications. One is Jesus had to be smitten for your record book in heaven to be white as snow and for his righteousness to be imputed on your account. 
so you could go to heaven. But when it comes to your relationship with God, you sin every day, and now God says you don't have to get saved again. You just have to speak to me and confess it, and I'll forgive you. And that's exactly what the problem was with Moses. It was like Moses crucified the Son of God afresh. And God says that's a no-no. He says you don't do that. And because of it, he lost his ticket to the promised land. So you can consider that being the great transgression. Look, Moses led those, those <laughs> cantankerous, murmuring, complaining Hebrews for 40 years. You better believe he wanted to go into the promised land. You better believe he wanted to. It would have been right for him to do that. Obviously, he was their leader, but he committed a great transgression. And God said, you ain't going into the promised land. That's a severe consequence. All right, let's look at another one. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 10. I'll turn over now to 1 Chronicles chapter number 10. 1 Chronicles chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 13 and 14. 1 Chronicles chapter number 10 and verses 13 and 14. All right. 1 Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 13. It says, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. All right, so King Saul was the first king in all of Israel. It was intended that Saul's children would carry on the kingdom and that Jesus would have come through the lineage of Saul. That was the intent. And the Bible says that when uh, King Saul was picked to be king by God, he was little in his own eyes, and uh, God turned him into another man, and he got the Spirit of the Lord upon him. But something happened, and when, when Samuel the prophet said, when you go kill um, uh, uh, all, all of the, um, uh, oh boy, it's the nation that started with um, Amalekites, he says, wipe them all out, every one of them. All their animals, I want them to be utterly destroyed. That was God judging the Amalekites. So what did Saul do? He kept the king, Agag, I believe is his name, kept him alive. And then the people kept the best of the animals alive to offer them as a sacrifice to the Lord. God didn't want a sacrifice from the Amalekites. He wanted them all wiped out. Well, Saul disobeyed. And that's when Samuel said to Saul, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. To obey is better than sacrifice. Samuel's saying, Saul, you should have obeyed the, the word of the Lord. You didn't. God's taken the kingdom from you and giving it to a man after God's own heart. That was when Saul crossed the line. That's when he committed the great transgression. And then as a result of it, the, whole, the, the Lord left him as far as the spirit of the Lord. And then when, Sam, when, when he was in a battle and he didn't know what to do, he went to a witch to get counsel. And because he went to that lady of a familiar spirit, God says, I, I am killing you. Are you listening? I am killing you and I'm taking away the kingdom. God said this to Saul, because you didn't obey my word, and because you sought counsel from a familiar spirit, he crossed the line. That's the great transgression. All the, it, 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 Jesus would have been the son of Saul. He would have sat on the throne of Saul for all eternity. It wouldn't have been the Davidic kingdom. It would have been, uh, however you pronounce it, the, the kingdom of Saul or whatever you want to call it. But uh, all of it went away when King Saul committed the great transgression. Again, he was a spiritual man at the beginning. Let's look at another one. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. Turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 12 now. Now we're going to see about David. And by the way, there was not a greater person in the Old Testament that was a man of faith like King David was. But he blew it. He committed a great transgression. Let me show you what he did. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, look down at verse number 7. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7, the Bible says this, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, here's the consequence. Watch this now. Now therefore, ready for this, the sword shall never depart from thine house. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives from before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. God was ready to kill him. Just like he killed Saul. God was ready to put David to death, but he confessed it. See, Saul didn't confess it. When he was confronted by Samuel, he made excuses for what he did. David, when he was confronted by Nathan, said, I did it. I sinned against the Lord. Now watch this in verse 14. Howbeit by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now watch this. David committed the, the great transgression. He committed adultery with your, your, uh, Bathsheba. He tried to cover up his adulterous affair by having Uriah sleep with his wife so that he would think the child that she was pregnant with was was uh, Uriah's and not David's, but Uriah had too much integrity and he wouldn't do it. So David sent Uriah back to the army, uh, to the front line and told Joab, let him die. And he died by the sword of Ammon. And so because of all of that, God said to David three things. He says, you just committed the great transgression. Number one, the sword's never leaving your house. Number two, I'm gonna bring up evil from within your own home, and that was Absalom that tried to overthrow his own daddy. And then he said, Bathsheba's pregnant, but that child is gonna die. And it's all because of you, David. Now here's David, a man after God's own heart. And he committed the great transgression. And he had to suffer for it. Now the difference between uh, Saul and David, David was humble and he repented. And he wrote that beautiful Psalm, 50, uh, Psalm 51 of him getting his heart right with God. Saul just was filled with pride and wouldn't even admit that he had done anything wrong. It made excuses. You know, when you get caught doing something wrong, the worst thing you can do is make an excuse for it. If you do something wrong, don't go, well, you know, this and this and this and this and this, just like Saul. When David was confronted with what he did, was, which was wrong, he said, I'm guilty. I sinned. No excuse. I sinned. Let's look at the fourth person that committed a great transgression. We saw Moses and King Saul and David. Look over at Matthew 27. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27. And let's look down at verse number one. Matthew chapter 27. This is all introduction, and then I'm going to give you three points and then a conclusion. Matthew chapter 27. Look down at verse number one. The Bible says, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to, the, to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. The fourth person we see that committed what we, the Bible calls the great transgression is Judas Iscariot. Now, I don't personally believe that Judas was saved. 
I believe that the Bible tells us that Judas went to his own place in hell. I personally believe that God is going to bring Judas or allow Judas Iscariot to come out of the pit of hell in the end times, and he's going to become the Antichrist. That's what I personally believe. He's going to indwell the body of whoever the Antichrist is going to be. Just like the devil's going to enter, uh, it's, it's the devil and the false prophet, that's the spiritual heretic and uh, leader, and then the Antichrist is the political leader, the Antichrist, I believe. God calls the Antichrist the son of perdition. And God called Judas Iscariot the son of perdition. And the reason I believe the Bible says that Judas went to his own place in hell is because it was different from everybody else who's gone to hell. And that's because God was going to allow him to come out in the end days. And then, of course, when Jesus comes back, he's going to put down that wicked one with the, with the, with the word of his mouth. And uh, he's going to put him, you know, put him down permanently. But the point is this. Judas Iscariot was with Jesus for three years. He crossed the line. He betrayed the Son of God. The great transgression. And the Bible says that Jesus said of Judas Iscariot, probably would have been better if you were never born. Wow. You know, there are some people that think hell is annihilation. It's not. I wish it was. That would bring some sense of comfort to our loved ones and friends who have gone to hell that instead of burning in a lake of fire forever, they would just cease to exist. Some people think my life is so bad that if I just cease to exist, that will relieve me of my pain. That's not really true, but here's the thing. God said about Judas Iscariot of him, it would have been better for you not to have been born. But you were. And you committed the ultimate great transgression. And you betrayed the Son of Man, the Son of God. Let's look at one last illustration. Look at Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> we talked about this in recent weeks, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I do want to read it just to mention it to you. Acts chapter number 5, just in case you think nobody can commit the great transgression in the church age, you're going to find out you're wrong. They can. Acts chapter number 5. Yes, sir? Yes, sir? He didn't repent to God. He repented to the men that he betrayed him to. That's the difference. The word repent means he changed his mind. So what he was saying is, I betrayed Jesus and I changed my mind. I want to give the money back. So he didn't repent to God. He repented to those men. And so that wasn't like getting saved. Does that make sense? Okay. You need to repent to God in order to get, you know, yes, sir. The word repent means I changed my mind about something I've done. That's all. And so, but he, that wasn't the same as the repentance that's needed to get saved. It's a different one. All right, Acts chapter 5. Good question, Reyes. Acts chapter 5, look at verse 1. It says, but a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And to keep back part of the price of the land, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, carried him out, buried him. It was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what, had, what was done, came in, and Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband." And great fear came upon all the church, upon all, as many as heard these things. All right, so we see here in the church, a husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, lied to the Holy Ghost. They agreed together, we're going to sell our land. We're going we're gonna to tell the, whole, the church, we're going to give the whole price of the land. But after they sold it, they kept part of it back. Let's just say 50%. 
Doesn't matter what the percent was, but let's just say that for the sake of our discussion. They gave 50% of the price of the land, kept 50% back, and, and Peter found out about it because the Holy Spirit told him. And by the way, just in case you don't think that the preacher has a right to talk to you directly about your sins, here's a perfect example. I'm, your, I'm, your, I, I'm the shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd. I'm the under shepherd. But the word pastor literally is defined as shepherd. And you're the sheep. Now, you're God's sheep, but God has entrusted me to help you and, and to lead you as, as the pastor. And if I see something in your life and I come to you one-on-one -on -one and talk to you about it, that's biblical. And here's exactly what Peter did. He went right to Ananias. What did you do, man? Did you sell that thing for 100000 or did you sell it for 200000 No, we sold it for 100000 Dude, you lied to the Holy Ghost. You're dead. He committed the great transgression. Peter gave Sapphira an opportunity to come clean. If she would have came clean, I don't think she would have died. But she didn't. They both committed the great transgression in the church, and then they died for it. So that tells me throughout all Old Testament, the time of Christ, the church age, it don't matter. The great transgression can happen. If I were you, I would not even come close to committing the great transgression in your life. You should want to avoid the, tra the great transgression at all costs. We all sin. But we do not all commit the great transgression. Now, the biblical progression that leads to the great transgression is found in Psalm 19. So turn back to our uh, main passage. And we're going to still look at some other passages here. But I want you to keep a bookmark there in a, or a ribbon in Psalm 19. Look at verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Number one, write down that word, errors. The first step, biblically speaking, that leads to the great transgression is when you commit errors. Sometimes people get real defensive about errors. It's just an error. I didn't intend to do it. That's fine. I understand that. What is the definition of the word error? It's this, a moral mistake. A moral mistake. In other words, it's not an intentional sin. It's a moral mistake. That's why David said, who can understand his errors? We make mistakes all the time. We, we often make errors. But listen to me, if you live a life continuously making errors, you are on your way to the great transgression. Think of Major League Baseball. Let's suppose Troy, uh, not Troy Tulowitzki, um, who's the shortstop for the Rockies? Uh, Trevor, uh, no, not Trevor Sim. Oh, my soul. Good night, man. <laughs> Someone help me out here. Okay, let's just talk about Nolan Arenado, the third baseman. Nolan Arenado, in the last five years in a row, I think he's gotten five gold gloves, so this ain't happening. But let's suppose Nolan Arenado went day by day by day committing crucial errors at the bad times in a baseball game. Let's suppose he went 15 games in a row and made 15 errors. You know what's going to happen? The manager is going to take him out of the game. Sit him down and say, look, dude, you got to get this fixed. You cannot be making errors every game. They might even send him down to the minor leagues to get some additional workouts and training to try to fix his errors. Everybody makes errors. Every major league baseball player commits at least one error every year. I mean, it's just human nature. But it's different to be again and again and again and again just continually making errors it's kind of like a football uh game you know we have a quarterback right now in the denver broncos that's a young quarterback he's got a serious problem this year he can't go a game without throwing an interception and when you throw interception after interception after interception or more than one interception game after game after game after game after game eventually you're going to get pulled you're not going to be the starting quarterback anymore and there's a history of professional athletes who were great athletes, but they couldn't stop committing errors. And it derailed their career. Look, everybody's going to commit an error from time to time. The problem is you don't want to just 
continually repeat that. Now, an error is a moral mistake. Let's look in the Bible just at a few places so we can see how God talks about errors. Look at Daniel chapter 6. In the Old Testament now, Daniel chapter number 6. Again, I'm going to help you to steer you away from the great transgression. But you've got to understand what leads up to the great transgression. The first thing that will get you going in the direction of the great transgression is errors. Look at Daniel chapter 6 and verse 4. Daniel chapter, we're going to come back to Psalms in just a little while, but so just keep a bookmark there. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. All right, so these Babylonian leaders, they got really mad at Daniel, and they, they were jealous of him because he was part of the Hebrew slaves. But yet he was elevated to one of the wise men in the Babylonian empire, and then now, uh, verse number six, or chapter six, it's the Medes and the Persians empire, and Daniel was regarded high. And these, uh, those that were of the Medes and Persians didn't like Daniel because he was a Hebrew, and they said, we got to find a way to get him out of here. And they looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. And he was, it says, that for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So they had to create a law, kind of like the Democrats have done with the election. They had to create a law, make it so that Daniel can get thrown into jail. It's the exact same thing. There is nothing new under the sun. I feel sorry for Christians who are deceived by the Democrat Party and liberals. I feel very sorry about that. I got no problem saying it. Too many preachers hadn't had enough courage to say things like that for all these years. I've lost church members, members this year because they hate Trump so much and they're so blinded by the Democrat Party. The fact of the matter is, is if you're going to have an honest candidate, an honest election, why do you have to create a bunch of laws at the last minute to change the procedures? And why do you have to do a bunch of shenanigans just to get your candidate in? If your candidate's so great, let him stand on his own merit. Let him rise or fall on his own merit. But here they tried to do the same thing to Daniel, and they couldn't find any errors in him. He, he, I guess Twitter wasn't invented, invented back then. But anyway, any rate, uh, they... <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't find any errors in him, and so they created a law that said if anybody prays to any god other than the king of the land for 30 days, let him get fed to the lion's den. And da Daniel said, look, I don't care. L listen to me. I don't care what law you pass. I'm not going to stop praying. Did you hear that, Mr. Polis? Governor Polis? I don't care what orders you, you e edict. We're not going to stop having church. Because there's certain things I'm not going to cross. I'm not going to violate God because of the laws of the land. Daniel got thrown in lion's den. God delivered him. But what was the problem? What, or what were they trying to do? They were trying to find an error in him. And he didn't have any. All right? Let's look at another passage. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to see another passage where God talks about an error. Romans chapter... <laughs> I guess I should get ready for Facebook jail on this one. Romans chapter 1, look down at verse 27. Romans chapter 1, God is addressing the abomination of homosexuality and lesbianism. And it says in verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, that men with men, working that which is unseemly, Watch this now. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. That's AIDS, by the way. That's the birth of AIDS. That's how AIDS comes, you know. All these, you know, they're born that way. They weren't born to do this. It's unseemly. It's an error. You know what? You know why, you know why I know homosexuality is an error? Not just because God says so. But because homosexuals cannot reproduce. If everybody on the planet, if all the human beings on the planet were homosexuals, the human race would die out. I think that's what the liberals want. They want us to die out, don't they? Uh, but all they can do is recruit. They cannot reproduce. And God says it's an error for a man 
to burn in his lust towards a man. It's not supposed to be that way. Let's continue. Look over, if you would, please, to James chapter 5. Facebook jail, here I come. James chapter 5. <laughs> We're live streaming on Facebook right now. Can I get an amen from you live streamers? All right, come on now. James chapter 5, <laughs> look at verse 20. James chapter 5, look at verse 20. The Bible says in James chapter 5 and verse 20, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You know what God says? You can get in the way of errors. You can commit error after error after error after error after error, and eventually you're going to die for it. And it's not because you're an evil person. You just can't help but make moral mistakes. And you make enough of them, and eventually you're going to die from it. You're going to die because of it. Let's look at another place, First or Second Peter chapter 3. Turn over to Second Peter chapter 3. Look at verse number, oh, let's see here. Where am I at? 2 Peter 3, verse 17. 2 Peter 3, and then verse 17, it says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. Why do people fall into Christian life? Not always because they're evil. It's definitely not because they're not true Christians. That's not the only reason. A lot of times Christians fall from their own steadfastness because they make too many moral mistakes. What's the, what's the error of the wicked? Here's what that means. You look at the world around you and you see how they live and you live like them. Whether you're trying to do something wicked or evil, it doesn't matter, but you act like them, talk like them, dress like them, behave like them, and eventually you're going to fall from the steadfastness of your faith because of the error of the wicked. One last verse about error, and then we're going to go back to Psalm 19. Look at Jude 1. Jude, right before the book of Revelation, there's only one chapter. Jude 1, look at verse 11. In Jude 1 and verse 11, the Bible says, Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Now, what did God talk about Balaam? Balaam was preaching for the enemy of God for a reward. I mean, he got paid to preach for the enemy of God. And the Bible says that he had to send a donkey to rebuke him. I mean, a, I mean, a donkey had to talk to him out loud. You know, the craziest thing about that story about Balaam and the donkey, the craziest thing about that story is not that the donkey talked, it's that Balaam talked back to him. What are you doing? Don't you see this angel with the sword drawn? He's going to kill you. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> do what I tell you, you rebellious donkey. He says, when have I ever disobeyed you? I've always done what you said. And Balaam, here's the second crazy thing, he lost the argument with the donkey. Oh, you're right, man, you never have. And I guess, thank you for saving me from that angel I couldn't see. And I'm sure the donkey went, <laughs> you know, just like that. But the fact of the matter is, what was the error of Balaam? He agreed to preach for the enemy of Israel for a reward. Now, he told them, I cannot but speak what God tells me to speak, but he should have never gone in the first place. He should have said, no, I'm not going to preach for the enemy of God and the enemy of Israel. But at any rate, that was an error, and eventually he ended up dying because of it later on in life. All right, so what leads us to the great transgression? Number one, it's errors. Number two, in Psalm 19, in verse number 12, it says, who can understand his errors? <clears throat> then it says, cleanse thou me from secret faults. The second step in the progression that leads to the great transgression is secret faults. What is secret faults? It's two things. It is hidden sins. And then secondly, it's blind spots. It's hidden sins. All right. A secret fault is a sin that you commit in secret, a hidden, uh, uh, it's hidden. You think nobody sees it, but God sees it. It's kind of like you being on the internet when nobody's looking and you're looking at internet pornography. You better be careful. 
You're on your way to the great transgression. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, listen to me now. Oh, I'm just looking. I'm not touching. Well, what do you think precedes touching? It's always looking. It always leads to touching. And it leads to violations. But the point of the matter is, I just use that as an example because it's a common secret fault in our society today. But also, it's blind spots. A weakness, here's what a blind spot is. You ever drive down the road in, in, on, on the road in your car and you looked in your mirror and you didn't see a car right there? You looked in the mirror in the back and you didn't see a car and you went to turn and then all of a sudden someone honks at you? They were in a blind spot. That's why you're supposed to turn your head every time that you, you, you switch lanes. Because there's a spot that the rear view mirror and the side mirror can't see. It's amazing how many times cars are in that spot or motorcycles. That's called a blind spot. Well, guess what? If you don't stop uh, switching lanes without looking in your blind spot, eventually you're going to get in an accident. And if you've got blind spots in your life and you don't deal with it, eventually it's going to lead to the great transgression. Let's just look at one verse with regards to secret faults, and then we'll come back and get the final point. Look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And look down at verse number 23. Psalm 139 and verse number 23, the Bible says this. King David, uh, again, great man of faith. Look what he says in verse 23. Search me, O God. Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. What David was saying is, I know I have secret faults. I don't know what they are. And he said, God, would you search my heart and reveal them to me? Ready? And I'll do something about it. Lead me in the way everlasting. So if you have blind spots... If you have hidden sins that you think nobody knows about it, so it's okay, look, ask God to reveal them to you and then deal with it. That's how you're going to overcome it. The third thing that leads to the great transgression, I said number one is errors, number two, secret faults, and then number three and last, and don't forget, I got a couple more references, and I'm going to give you a conclusion. So we've done about five or ten minutes. All right, look at verse 13. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Write that down. Number three, presumptuous sins. What is presumptuous sins? Here's basically what it is. It is to arrogantly sin by thinking all will be well anyway. A presumptuous sin is when you arrogantly sin, but you think it's all going to turn out well anyway. You say, how do I know that? Well, you see, here's what you say. Well, I'm going to commit this sin, and then when I'm done, I'm 1 John 1, 9. I'll commit this sin, and then I'll just confess it to God, and everything will be all right. No, that ain't going to happen that way. God does not like presumptuous sins. This is the third and final step before the great transgression takes place. You presume everything's going to be all right. You arrogantly say, I know this is wrong, I know it's a sin, I'm going to commit it, but when I go to church on Sunday, I'll go to the altar and ask God to forgive me about it. Everything's going to be just fine. You do that enough, and I promise you, you're going to be committing the great transgression. Look at Numbers chapter 15. We're going to look at three references, and then I'm going to give you the conclusion, concluding thoughts, and we're done. Numbers 15, look at verse 30. But I hope this is worth you being here tonight. Numbers 15, because I, you know, listen very carefully. There have been greater preachers than I, and I sincerely and very honestly and openly and humbly say this, there have been many greater preachers than I who have committed the great transgression, and they're no longer in the ministry. Preachers that could preach better than I have. Preachers that have won more souls to Christ than I have. Preachers that have been, have, larger churches than I have, but I'm still pastoring and they're not. And it's not because I'm better than them, it's because they committed the great transgression and they're no longer in the ministry. More than anything, I don't want to commit the great transgression and I don't want you to commit it either. I want you to stay in God's will from now till the day you die or until the Lord comes back. 
Look at Numbers 15, verse 20. I'm sorry, Numbers 15, verse 30. It says, but the soul that doth ought presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. What's the problem? In verse 30 it says, but, but the soul that doeth ought presumptuously. Oh, I know, I know this is wrong. I'll commit it, but everything will be all right anyway. I'm a tither. I'm a soul winner. Nobody's perfect. So I'm going to commit this sin, and because I tithe, and because I go soul winning, and because I'm faithful to church, God's just going to let it go. Um, you are presuming way too much. If God did what he did to David, when he is a man after God's own heart, the great King David, and yet the sword never left his house, his son Absalom was going to rise up against him, and the child that was conceived in the adulterous act was going to die. If God did that to David, who are you and who am I? To presume that because we're such a faithful or whatever we think we are Christian, that we can just commit this sin and everything's going to be all right. That's called presumptuous. Look at Deuteronomy 17. <clears throat> one, one book over to the right. Deuteronomy 17. Look at verse 12. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 12. The Bible says this in Deuteronomy 17, 12. And the man that will do presumptuously and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die. And thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. God calls presumptuous sins evil, right? In the Old Testament, they didn't have pastors, but they had priests. And the Bible says the priests would tell them spiritually, hey, don't do this. The guy presumed to do it anyway. And they even had a judge. Hey, this is breaking the law. Don't do this. They did it anyway. They ended up dying for it. One last passage. Look at Hebrews 10. Go to the New Testament now. We're going to look at what God's and the New Testament says about presumptuous sins. People get Hebrews 10 all confused and all misunderstood. This is not talking about losing your salvation. Nobody ever loses their salvation. If you got saved the Bible way, it's eternally secure. Nobody loses their salvation. But in the New Testament age, which is the church age, which is what we're in right now, you can commit presumptuous sins even though you're saved, but you're going to have to suffer the consequences of it. All right? Look at Hebrews 10, verse 26. We're going to read down to verse 31. Hebrews 26, verse 30, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 26, for if we, now who's the word we talking about? It's talking about the writer of the book of Hebrews, which is, in case you don't know, Paul the Apostle. Um, number two, it's the, it's the people he's writing to, the Hebrew Christians, right? So watch this. For if we, that's Paul and the Hebrew Christians, sin willfully, after that we've received knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. How many of you have been saved, and then after you got saved, you did something that you knew was wrong, and you did it anyway? Would you raise your hand? I've done it. Good night, man. That's called sinning willfully. <laughs> after that, you've been saved, right? God says there remains no more sacrifice for sins. It's like going speeding down Highway 25. You've heard me say this many times before. I suppose I go 100 miles an hour down Highway 25. Cop pulls me over and says, sir, you're speeding. Speed limit 75, you're going 100. I say, don't worry about it, officer. I'm saved. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. Jesus paid for this sin. Uh, this violation of the law when he died on the cross and I received him as my savior. The police officer is going to say, um, sorry, uh, you're getting a ticket. <laughs> I don't care what, what you think about Jesus saving your soul, you're getting a ticket for speeding. And that's what that means. You're, you, there's no more sacrifice for that. If you sin willfully after that you've been saved or received knowledge of the truth, you're going to suffer the consequences for it. But a fearful, a certain fearful, looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now watch this. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sore punishment, ready for this? Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, ready, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, 
wherewith he was sanctified. It's another way of saying that he got saved. He, all his sins were washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Watch this now. An unholy thing, and it's done despite under the Spirit of grace. That means he got saved, but he, he lived opposite of what a saved person should live like. He got saved and said, okay, I'm going to heaven. I can live any way I want. That's what this, this person is doing. For we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge who? Not unsaved people here. I mean, he will, but I mean, this context is not unsaved people. It's you and I, his people. You can't become his people unless you're saved. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. That's all about presumptuous sins. Now, here we go. Here's the conclusion. You ready? The biblical progression that leads to the great transgression. Errors, secret faults, presumptuous sins, and next thing you know it, you commit the great transgression. You cross a line with God and forfeit all or part of the will of God. It is an exceeding violation of the law with the most severe consequences. So, listen this carefully. No one is exempt. If Moses, King Saul, David, Judas Iscariot, Ananias, and Sapphira were not exempt, you and I are not either. Are you listening? So how do I avoid the great transgression? Simply three things. Remember what the three steps were that lead to the great transgression? Okay, number one, limit your errors. You're not going to be living a whole life and never commit an error. That's not going to happen. But limit it. Don't just keep committing the same errors over and 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 over again. It's like that man who came to me, who was on his fifth marriage. He came to my office and said, we need marriage counseling. And I said, okay, let's talk. And he brought his husband, uh, brought his wife in, and he, he was the husband. I said, what's going on? We just can't get along. This is crazy. And I said, okay, well, what's the problem? And he told me. And then he finally said, you know what? I just don't understand it. I just keep picking the wrong women. I looked at him and said, exactly. You got to share in this responsibility, bud. This is your fifth marriage. Learn. Sit there and say, I just keep picking the wrong women. Well, the dummy. What are you doing picking the wrong women for? It's your fault. You just admitted to it. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Look, <laughs> I did this. It didn't turn out. So let's do it again. Didn't turn out. All right, let's do it again. Didn't turn out. The definition of insanity. Keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Look, you're going to make an error. You're going to. Just don't keep repeating them. Limit them. Limit your errors. Let, number two, ask God to reveal secret faults. It's like that passage in uh, uh, first, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms 139 when David said, Lord, reveal unto me what's in my heart that's wicked. Lead me in the way everlasting. Ask God to reveal your secret faults. And then number three and last, never arrogantly sin against God. Never. So if you want to keep yourself from the great transgression, limit your errors, ask God to reveal secret sin or secret faults, and then never, don't allow yourself, never arrogantly sin against God. Don't do that. And guess what? You're still a sinner saved by grace. You still have problem with road rage. Brother Tim. <laughs> you still have sins in your life. Maybe it's a cigarette. Man, I wish I could stop smoking cigarettes. I wish I could. I mean, I just, I struggle with it. No, that's not me. I'm not talking about you right now. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about my deacons. Uh, my deacons are saying that right now. Uh, but, uh, but, but whatever, right? You, you're not going to be perfect. You're still going to you know, have a sin nature. But here's the thing. You don't want to commit the great transgression. You avoid these three things. Multitudes of errors or repeated errors. Secret faults and presumptuous sins. And you'll be kept. You'll be innocent from the great transgression. That's what I want for you. And that's what I want for me. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. Thank you for the people that listened while I was preaching instead of talking or looking at their phone or misbehaving. Thank you for those who are here with their mind and with their heart because Lord, I want every teenager here and I want every adult here to be innocent from the great transgression. And Lord, I know who I am. I honestly am a sinner saved by grace. I want to keep myself from the great transgression. Father, please help us now. Heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. As always, 
If there's anybody here that needs to be saved during this invitation, would you please let me know? However, if God did speak to your heart, please do not leave church tonight without doing business with God. Those of you watching online, make an altar wherever you're at. Do business with God right now. Heavenly Father, please bless this invitation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to our hearts. Help us to respond properly and bless those who do in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? Piano still play. If God spoke to your heart, you come. You kneel and pray at the altar. Pray in your pew if you would like, but just do business.